Hello friends, this is Donna Cato. Welcome to my channel. It's December 2022 and I know I told you that I wasn't going to do any tutorials this month because I had to rest and recharge and get some new ideas and get ahead of the tutorial game and be better prepared for January 23 and the coming year. But I made this and it really is timely. And so it's appropriate that this tutorial go up at this time. So I can't hug each of you and I can't send each of you a card, but uh, through this tutorial, maybe I can thank you, send my gratitude for your kindness and your support of me and this channel. I wanna thank you. I really appreciate each of you and uh, I hope you know that. So on we go. I wish you the happiest of holidays and a prosperous, rewarding, and even peaceful new year. So coming up, the Peace Dove. Let's get started. Now let's take a look at the actual piece and what we're going to need. Now I'm using Starry Night Canes, of course, so if you need to, please watch the other classes particularly the one that's very in-depth about how you make them. Um, you could also, of course, use flat color. You don't have to use the Starry Night Canes. You can use the same sort of techniques with, uh, with uh, Skinner blends or with solid colored clay. All right, so you can see that what we need here are Starry Night Canes and the following uh, colorations black and those are the lines this is the background color turquoise you could of course use any color this one is violet you need a starry night cane with a lot of a lot of white and a little tiny bit of gray and black you need two greens for the leaves now we won't be doing the letters in this tutorial i am working on doing a complete alphabet I don't know when that's going to be done, but uh, in this particular tutorial, there are no letters. We're just doing the actual image. Okay, now you also need a ceramic tile, and you're going to need scrap clay that has been rolled through a fairly thin setting. Mine is setting number five on my pasta machine that starts at zero. Now, I'm going to tilt this up. You see, I just lightly sketched what I'm going to do on the surface of the clay with my needle tool, okay? And that is what I'm going to be following as I work. Now, every slice you cut will be thinned in exactly the same way. This is the finished uh, piece of black but I'm gonna show you on, let's do the turquoise. Okay, now I am going, I say now a lot, I'm gonna try to stop doing that. Every slice I cut is, I'm, I'm going to aim toward approximately two millimeters, all right? Now, if I made it very wide and then rolled it down to this very thin setting, what would happen is all of this would get way stretched out, really stretched out. You might try that out, you might like it. I have found that for the scale that I'm uh, making these pieces, that cutting at about two millimeters thick works best for me. All right, so that's approximately two millimeters thick. So let me take this and I'm going to place this edge on my pasta machine, roll it through setting number six. And this is what I have. Now I like texturing it and I want to texture it automatically because I find that um, it's much easier if I do it this way, rolling the strip with a texture sponge through the machine. 
So I'm going to roll it through again, the same setting, setting number six. Okay, so you can see that it's textured. So I don't have to do that. I don't have to take at the finished piece and dab it and dab it and dab it and try to texture the whole piece. Now, I will do a little bit of it because this kind of action, dabbing, after it's all put together, will help join the pieces together. But um, the basic texture will be there. All right, so let us begin. Now, the first thing I'm going to do, see, I said now again. I don't know. I have to find a new word. What can I say instead? Oh, I don't know. I'll think about it. Okay. So I'm going to take and just cut like so. So I have a nice straight edge. And I'm going to cut a very thin strip like so. And it's stuck to my blade, as you can see. The first thing I do is take this and kind of feed it down. And it will end there. That is where this particular piece hits the main part of the branch, okay? Now you can move it if you're not exactly in the right place. You can sort of take it and slowly push it into place if it's not exactly where you want it like so. I have prepared this piece. I didn't texture it though, so what I'm going to do is roll it through the pasta machine once again with the sponge. Okie dokie. Let me Put a nice straight edge, and I will take and just feed this along the stem. And trim the excess away, and then lift. So you can see that I'm going to be putting this, these pieces down, lifting them, moving them. So you want to use a clay that is not extremely sticky. If you use a clay that's very, very sticky, what will happen is you are going to be fighting with the clay. You will put it down, it will stick too readily, and then it will probably tear when you pull it up and it just makes everything so much more difficult so try to use a base clay and uh, a starry night clay that isn't really really soft and sticky okay it, it i'm not saying it's impossible to do i'm just saying it's much more difficult okay now i'm going to take I don't know why I keep saying now, but I do. All right, so there's my, oh, I have to cut. Actually, I didn't have to cut. I just had to cut off whoever that was on the phone. Life happens into every life a spam phone call must fall. 
All right, so here is another piece. And you can see that I used it for something else. So you're going to have a lot of these scrap pieces. Just take a piece of deli paper, set it aside, and lay them out because chances are you're going to use them. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to take and just feed this one around the other side of the stem. And I could feel I had something on the back of this. That's not good. But it's also not a tragedy. I'm going to move this over. And I'm going to do my best today to keep my hands and to keep my work under my phone camera. All right. Let us trim. You can see that I don't really pat the clay down too hard. I don't, I don't, because I know I'm going to want to be able to do this. You will cut only through the clay, not through the clay in the base. Only cut this, not the gray clay. Set that aside, turn it. And let's cut the other side of the leaf. Remove the excess. And just take your time. I mean, I find this whole process really enjoyable. The piecing and the putting things together. I really, I really do like it, so. Now let's cut another piece of black, also thin. Because basically I'm just outlining, aren't I? I'm outlining these elements in the picture. Okay, I'm just going to take and try to push that up against there. And I'm not gonna lie to you, sometimes it gets very frustrating. You know, you're working, I'm working with something quite thin here. So you have to be a little flexible. You have to be willing to change your strategy just slightly because your clay has decided to do its thing because it has a mind of its own. All right. Now I'm going to... Push it right up against the edge there. Now, at this point, if you feel that your black outline is too thick, you can also, of course, cut excess clay away and remove it. Sometimes it gets a little difficult because we're dealing with these tiny little strips of clay. So... Sometimes part will hang back and stay, and you just have to use whatever tools you have to sort of scrape and remove it without cutting into the base gray. Okay. Next, we have to do another leaf. I will take this, and we will... position it and chances are you're going to be doing a lot of this turning the tile as you work business Now, 
I will take the green and I'm going to cut there and let's just take it on the outside. And coax it around like so. Take another piece. I just want to add a tiny bit, not too much, because I don't really want these leaves on the side to be bigger than the one in the middle. Okay. Now, when you're going around a curve like this, sometimes you'll get a gap here. Not a problem. Just take more clay and fill it in. Now, this gap is almost not there, so I'm not really concerned about it. Now, I will take my tool and push the stem up to the leaf. Okay, okie dokie, I think I'll cut it there. And I'm going to take this piece again. Make it a little bit more manageable. Like so. And you can see I just kind of feed it around. Now this time I had to stretch this edge and compress this edge. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. Now I will take my scalpel. Cut. Like so. And then cut the other side. Now let's outline. And you know, I left this here because I didn't know exactly how long it was going to be, but it's very convenient. Just took it and spun it around. And now I will cover this side of the leaf. Then take my little sculpture tool, and I like this tool very much. It's like this shallow sort of spoon on one side, but I find the back side is very nice for this kind of work. Or I just want to push some clay up into position like this, and I want a tool that isn't going to cut the clay as I push. Okay, so the outside is quite a bit easier, of course. Let me see if I have some little scraps. And I do. You'll find that when you do work like this, you end up with a lot of little tiny pieces like that. That come in handy and can certainly be used in situations like that.
I have one more leaf to do and I will do that. You don't have to watch me do it because you've seen me do these two. So let me get that done. That's one leaf here. And then we will begin working on the actual bird head. Be back. In situations like this, where this leaf is actually going to be a little bit behind this one, of course, I'm going to have to trim this excess clay. And I, I want to trim right along that edge. I can't exactly see that edge. So I'm just going to do my best. Bring it up. I think it's about there. Cut. Yeah. Like so. And you can almost see the clay underneath, but um, just do your best to estimate where you think it is, and you're probably going to be right. There we go. Now I'm going to take this end, and as I did before, I'm just going to turn it back and feed it along that edge. Cut the excess away. Remove it gently. Then take this little piece. All I need is a little piece there. There we go. And I need one more little piece. I cut little pieces all over. Let me see if this little piece is big enough or if it's too little. Very good. Very good. Again, if I want to push this up against, and you know, by pushing this up like so, I'm also actually making it a bit thinner. I don't want these black lines to be really, really thick. I'm going to cut this excess away because there's just too much clay there. Sometimes there just physically is too much clay. And the only thing you can do is cut it and remove it. So there are my three olive leaves. Now, making the branch is simple. It's just slightly thicker. I'm wearing my sort of down sweater because it's really cold. It's winter time in the mountains. In la montagna. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. I just have to decide whether I want it to curve that way or this way. Maybe I'll curve it this way. It kind of makes more sense. I have to move stuff. You see, that's one of the hazards of working this way too. You set things down because you need them to work on and then you slide your tile over and wreck something. Ask me how I know. And I could lift this up and move it, but it's really better, I think, just to make the logical curve 
and then trim away the clay inside. I'm wasting just this little bit, but maybe it's not even wasted. I may use it for something else. But then I know that this is this is a proper, correct curve of this particular piece of clay. I have to move this again. All right. Now, I'm going to have to make the beak. Okay. Ta-ta! You see? So, let us get started. I am going to work on the bird head, then I will work on the beak. And I may have to remove this. We'll see. I mean, sometimes you get into these situations where you have a lot going on in a very small area. There's one piece of beak here, and then there's a tiny piece of beak here, another tiny piece of beak, and of course all the tiny pieces are outlined. You see, they're all they're all outlined. The open mouth meant that I had a little tiny piece of violet, little tiny piece. You know, you can get in these situations where you have a lot of little tiny pieces. Sometimes uh, it, it's more difficult, but not impossible. So let's do it. I'm going to take a piece of black. Clay, just plain old black clay. I'm rolling it through setting number six. There we go. And I have to cut here because I completely forgot of the birdie eyeball and I have to find a little tool, so I'll be back. Now this is a Kemper cutter and this is what I'm going to use to make my eye. The birdie eye. And I'm just going to take my black clay and I'm going to set it down. I think the birdie eyeball is right there. So I'm just going to push, lift it up, and then lift up the black clay. Okay. Now this is setting six. So I think it's going to be pretty much the same thickness. But this is the one spot where the clay is a little bit higher because I'm going to put an eyelid. I'm going to put an upper eyelid and a lower eyelid around the eye. Okay? And that happens after I have put this other white clay on. I have to roll some of this white. I should have thought about doing that before. Approximately two millimeters thick. Roll it through setting number six. Roll it through setting number six with the texture comb. Now, if you establish um, a set way of doing this. Maybe for you it's setting four, maybe it's five, maybe whatever it is, but if you stick to it pretty much, then what will happen is you will have a lot of pieces sort of organized in a different place that you can pull from and use. So try to establish some kind of set method that you like and try to stick to it. And I think that you will find that you have a lot of uh, these useful pieces to pull from. Okay, so I, I encircle the eye first, like so.
see I have to move over because now my collection of slices is growing to my right. Okay. So if you look, this is what I'm going for. So pretty much I've got this line from the inner eye and the outer eye, and it just kind of goes out. Now, this isn't really straight. I didn't do a great job making it straight. I'm not sure it matters, to tell you the truth. But let me try this time to do it that way. Okay. So I'm just basically starting at the eye and going, er, trim, er, trim, er, trim, and then er, 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 like that. Okie dokie. Inner eye, outer eye, let me just draw a line. And that's what I will try to stick to. And up here, very hard. I can't exactly draw the line, so I will just cut and remove some of the clay. Okay, let me scoot that over. Now on this side, I will simply follow the line like so. This white clay is quite a bit softer than, uh, than the other clay. Sometimes that happens. We try very hard to make the clay the same consistency and softness all the time, but I'm not exactly sure that's really possible. It's a goal. Now there's the line for the head, the outside of the head. So just gonna follow that down like that and remove. Okay. Okie dokie. Now let me go and do the next one. See, this is stickier clay. Now, as it was explained to me some years ago, that this difference in the consistency of different clays has much to do with the type of colorants that are used. You see, they're not all dry or they're not all wet. And some colorants are wet, some are dry. And polymer clay is not an easy thing to make. It's a rather difficult thing to make, and the smallest quantities of something can make a tremendous difference in the consistency, the overall consistency of the clay. I mean, we're talking about something as small as a cup of something in a 2,000 pound batch. And that's what I was told. Now, it's been some time, so I don't know if that is still true, but I got that from a very reliable source. Okay, there's my dog again, barking. I love that guy, but I wish he would stop barking. Okay, I'm gonna move this, this will help. Okay, so I'm going to cut another strip. Oh, Louie, please be quiet. And gently pull it around the bottom of the eye, like so. And then trim, and then trim there. Then cut away that little 
bit that was hanging into the beak. Okay, so I think you get the picture. I will continue filling in the face and then, um, then I'll have to wrap that with a thin piece of black. Then we will work on the beak. The birdie head is done. So now I'm going to take and I'm going to wrap it with this black. And you know, it is a little too, the area is a bit too small to rely on the old leave it on the blade, wrap it around trick that I sometimes do. But not in this case. There just isn't enough room. When you're working off the blade like that, you have a very thin piece and you're trying to wrap it around. Well, you gotta watch out for this end of the blade because that end of the blade can completely destroy your work. Now, while we're here, I think we're going to go ahead and put the gray above the eye. Now, this is a so kind of a mid-gray, or actually, this was the darker gray that I had, but I'm going to cut a very thin strip. Like so. And take it first below the eye, like this. You know, it looks a little dark, doesn't it? It's too dark. So it is the wrong gray. This is too dark. So I'm gonna set this aside and I'm gonna show you the correct gray. See how much lighter this is? So let me prepare the sheet and I'll be back. That lighter gray is prepared. So now I will use this to go around the eye. Now, the last time I did this and showed you, I had actually cut the strip so that the stripes were parallel, not perpendicular. I think I'm gonna do perpendicular because I think that might look better around the eye. And you know what, if I'm not happy with it, I'll just take it up and do it again. But something tells me that I might really like this. Okay. I lost it. Okay.
now it's time to trim. To move all my slices. a little highlight in that eye. Doesn't look like just a dead shark eye. Okay, so there he is. There's his little eyeball. Next, the beak. And I forgot to tell you, for the beak, you're going to need yellow. Or, you know, I mean, some birds have gray beaks. A lot of birds have gray beaks. Maybe I'll just use the gray beak. Make it a little different. Birdies do have gray beaks. So I will use this lighter gray again. And I think that this is the distance from the head to the tip of the beak I want. If it's not correct, then I guess I have to do it again. Would not be unheard of. So let me just take and rest that like that. Yeah, and sometimes you wish you had like Superman x-ray vision where you could see through your polymer clay slices. Okay, I'm going to remove a little bit of that because I have to outline it. Dang, I do. Once you start, you can't stop. I have to cut a new little piece. Like so. Okay, there's the upper beak. Now let's put the lower beak in. It gets more complicated the more cuts and cutouts you have. As you can see, now I have to deal with the stem and that's why I think I'm going to lift the stem up and you know I'm going to put it back down should have done that before I did this part but I'm not too terribly concerned about it because that stem is going to be positioned there at some point in time Okay. Mm. 
Let me try to get that back up there. Sometimes you have to coax, coax the clay. Here's that old stem, that old stemmy thing. Let's say that it's right there. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay, so now I'm going to cut the clay underneath, like so, and remove what was underneath. this little guy back in place, like so. Cut that off. It doesn't have to be that long. Okay. So now we have olive leaves on a branch, and we have our dove head in place. The next thing I will do is put the wing here. I like adding that, just that small element, the wing. There's that little bit of white there along the bottom. Like a dove in flight. And this time I will put the curvature of the wing on first. You know, the order that you're gonna do these things is largely dictated by how large the area is. This is quite a large area that I'm going to fill. I mean, compared to these little tiny areas or tiny areas like that beak. as to whether you outline first and then fill, or you fill and then you take your black clay and outline later. Because sometimes it's definitely easier to do one or the other, but not always, sometimes. Okay. So here's more of this white clay. That I will put in. So the wing is, of course, an example of filling and then outlining. Now the piece is not going to be nearly this big, so I'm going to cut here. So I really don't want it to be huge or more huge, huger. than it is. Okie dokie. So now we have leaves bird head 
beak. We've done the eye detail and the wing. The next thing we have to do is the background. I'm going to use this turquoise that I rolled before. I'm pretty much through with that black clay and the gray and the white and all of these little scraps, many of which will turn into new Starry Night Canes. Cut here. Now I'm also, uh, I've got this strip, but I'm going to cut a piece off the back like so. So I can cut so that the stripes are parallel to the sides, or I can cut so that they are perpendicular to the sides. And I do use both. I'll show you. There's my dog again. So this is from a parallel cut, but right next to it, you can see that this is from a perpendicular cut. So I use them both. And I think that using them both creates a certain kind of, mm, is, uh, there's more movement and there's more rhythm. This is, uh, a, first of all, the Starry Night Cane was a lot finer in pattern. Here it is like this. Than, um, than this one. Okay, so when I used it, it was very much the same in both directions. And also this has a pattern. So we will be using, we will be doing this technique using cuts from both directions. Okay, so first I'm gonna start yeah, with kind of a tiny strip. It gets, and this is another reason why you don't want a clay that's extremely sticky, because when you get to this kind of trimming, it can be very difficult. Now, I'm going to take my blade, and I'm trying to cut along one edge of the stem and pick it up like so. Now I will take my scalpel this time because I want to cut along this edge of the leaf and it is not terribly curved but just a bit I think. And to remove it sometimes it helps kind of rock it gently back and forth. I still left some of it. But I think I can probably remove this little bit like so. Just pick it up with the tip of my scalpel. Okay, so these little tiny areas can sometimes be challenging, but certainly not impossible. Okay, I'm setting that down, and this time I'm going to cut on the other side of the stem. And then I will try to cut along the edge, the outer edge of the leaf like that and then remove this piece. Now I will try to cut along the perimeter of the leaf next to it. And this is just this ridiculously tiny space right here. So let me see if I can just insert a, the tiniest little sliver there.
All right, so that I think is probably the most difficult area. I think everything else is kind of easy compared to these three little spaces. Okay, so let me take this and let's see if I can insert this kind of in there and then pull it around the outside like so. Once again, I've got to be aware of where all of that clay underneath might be and then remove it. Then remove the clay from on top of the beak. And I cut a tiny bit too much away. And uh, that will happen. Obviously, it just happened. So let me just see if I can get a little tiny piece back in there. Oops. Now let me take a piece that I'm going to cut so that the stripes are perpendicular to the sides. That would be a straight cut across like this, but I think I'm going to angle it, so making it more like this, a wedge. I'm going to put the wedge in like that. Now I will return to this parallel cut. Let me put that right next to it. So that is basically the way all of this happens. It's just every now and then using this uh, perpendicular cut, mixing it in with the parallel cuts. And I think you get a nice sense of movement then in the background that you don't, that I wouldn't have necessarily if I, um, if I made them all the same way. I, I would get movement that way too. It would just be different. So I will finish and then I will be back. Now the background is filled in and what remains is trimming the overall piece. You can see that the shape of this piece, I'll turn it around, is sort of shorter and wider. This one is sort of triangular. And this can be the scary part. Uh, it can be it can be the scary part. You have to believe me, I know. It can be the scary part. So the way I approach this is first to eliminate certain areas that uh, areas of the scrap clay. I don't just automatically cut. I work my way slowly to the final shape. The 
so it really helps to get rid of the gray field around. Okay, so there's a rough cut, just a rough cut, and I'm not going to cut a lot away. Now, I think I will fill this little space in, though. There. Okay, so let me start down here and just... So, you know, they're always different because the position of the bird and the position of the leaves and the way the leaves curve is not always the same for me. I don't follow a pattern. I have a good general idea. I do follow my lightly, you know, what I did in the very beginning, but it's always different. It has to make sense, though, so a continuation of this line across would probably be about here. Now, um, I see another tiny spot that could probably use a bit of clay. Continuation of this line is probably something along these lines. And this one can actually curve slightly out and then maybe in like so. Okay, and I like that. I think I'll stick with this. Is there too much of the birdie head? Maybe I'll trim a bit of that off, like the back. Just a tad. And now this will be cured in the oven and um, then we'll finish it. So the piece is out of the oven. It's still warm. It's on the tile. I will leave it here until it's cool. I do want to point one thing out to you though. You know, I make so many things and sometimes you just fall into this. You fall into a groove and you just go along and sometimes you make, you know, it's been, um, a while since I made these original ones, a couple weeks probably. And so, you know, I was looking at this and thinking, what is different about it? Something's different. I know what it is. 
and it concerns the beak. You see this, how it goes in and out like that. This one is the same way, in and out. Well, this one I made straight across the face, the front of the face. And it is interesting that it does make a difference, quite a difference to me, in terms of the expression on the face of the bird. Okay. So if you prefer this look, then when you put it together, you must build the beak so that it comes in and out like that just comes into the face and out. It's not difficult to do, really. It's just that you kind of have to be aware of things like that. It's a small difference in terms of the way you make it, right? It's a very small difference, but I think it makes quite a difference in the expression on the face. Also, this beak is smaller, but this one's probably about the same size. But still, it's really funny that just one, that one small change makes a difference. Now, this piece looks incomplete to me. Perhaps it's because of the other pieces, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my letters and I will write piece right here. I will fill this space with letters and I will spell out piece. Okay. Now, this is still warm, as I said, so it's going to sit here until it cools, till it's cold, and then I'll be back. Now it's time to finish our little birdie pin. So I'm going to glue a tie tack back on it, and I think it'll probably go about right there. Okay, there we go. I'll put this on and hold it down just a tad for a few seconds so that the tie tack is glued to the clay, not to the glue. Okay, that's good. Now I've rolled my black clay through setting number six on my pasta machine and I'm going to texture it same way I always texture by rolling it through the pasta machine with a texture sponge. And just take the sponge and just pull it off of the clay good deal. Let me trim this part away that wasn't textured because the clay was wider than the sponge. Oops. And now I'm going to take liquid clay And I am going to apply it to the back of the piece. Then I will take the black clay and press it to the back, like so. And just get rid of the excess. You get so much clay, it just gets in the way just flopping all over. So it makes it a bit easier if you get rid of some of this excess. Okay, now it's time to trim the rest of it away. 
And I'm just using my scalpel Actually, I think technically I'm using a craft knife. And I do use my fingers and my hand. Actually, just my fingers. Uh, to prevent the clay from slipping as I'm cutting. If your clay starts slipping as you're cutting, I think I've talked about this before in other tutorials, it pulls away from the edge and then uh, you don't have enough clay. Then the back is exposed. So it's helpful if you can to use your fingers the tips and the sides to hold the clay against the back. good. Double check the points and make sure the clay is all the way to the points. Now I will take a needle. This is an acupuncture needle and I'm just going to pierce the clay in many spots just in case there are any air pockets between the clay, the raw clay, and the back. So those little holes are just an escape route for any air that might be trapped. Now I will take my signature. Oops. And I'm gonna put this right there. I decided I would put peace on on the front because there's that space and it is asking for something to fill it. And what these are is, um, uh, I think they're used for ceramics and I was at, I think a garage sale and somebody had a big box of these so I bought them because I thought, Someday they'll come in handy, and you know what? They have, because I will cure my piece like this, all right? And of course, the, the uh, tie tack back just falls into one of the holes. Now here are my letters. I am going to do tutorials on making letters. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I am. I'm just trying to organize it in a logical fashion. I mean, many letters share similarities, and sometimes you can start with one letter, and it just kind of obviously transitions into another. So there's the P. I need two E's. I'm going to try to make them the same thickness. One A and one C. I have written P. Okay, here, P. That looks better. And let's take our C. and cut it, and there are my letters. Now before I put them on, I think I'll clean them up a bit. 
maybe square them off if they don't look really perfect. I believe the P was a little larger than is I think the C is a little larger as well than certainly than the E. All right, so let's put these letters on. Now I'm just going to take my brush and I'm going to apply liquid clay to the area where I'm going to be putting my letters, just like so. And this is what I did with the others and it doesn't really show up. I don't want to ruin it. And it's sticking to me. You know what? I'm cutting off more of this pea like that. I think that's better. Come on, you can do it. No, I can do it if I do it fast enough. Yes, I wanted an alphabet so I could write words instead of transferring them. I could actually write them. And that's why I have these the letters I have. I just simply haven't finished because if I had an O, an N, an R, and a T, I could write peace on earth. But I have to get cracking and I have to make more letters. Now, this will go back in the oven. I am going to cure this for 30 minutes at 300 degrees. It's already been cured for about 30. And I have to watch out because of this white. We remember. I mean, I don't really want my dove to turn tan or ecru, although it certainly might. We shall see. I have high hopes. I will be back. The piece is cured. And what you need to do now is sand the whole edge. And what I use is this Abranet P80. It's very coarse, but it takes the clay down really fast. And what you want is a very smooth edge here. Okay. So I've already done that. It's already done. So now I'm ready to finish the edge because that doesn't really look very good, does it? You've got the black base, you've got the scrap clay, and then you've got uh, the Starry Night Kings on the surface. I'm gonna put this on because I keep poking myself. Okay, so let me move this over. Now, what I'm going to use is this. DecoArt Americana Acrylic Paint. 
and it's a lamp ebony black and I like this because it's a very matte black it's not shiny so that's what I'm going to use and it works fine Oops, the paint. Oh dear. Oh dear, I managed not to do that for so long and now I've done it. Paint all over me. Okay, so if you've watched my YouTubes, you know I'm a messy gluer. Well, I'm also a messy painter. Okay. Okay, so let's take and just paint all the way around. Now, because the back is black, I'm a little less concerned about it. So as I'm applying the paint, I'm kind of watching where it's hitting that corner with the top. So you don't really want any black paint on the surface. All right. And I do like that matte black. All right, so I will continue and I will do the whole thing and then I'll be back. Here we are, the pin is done. I painted the edging with that nice lamp black. I like it a lot. So, we're at the end of class. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned a thing or two. And, um, well, until we meet again, I'm Donna Cato, signing off.